Thank you, and good morning, colleagues. Um, let me begin by saying it is an enormous honor to have been invited here to speak to this distinguished gathering, and I'm looking forward to the outcomes of these very important deliberations. Now, the original title of my talk was to be Professional Development in the UK at the National Science Learning Centre. Um, but having the advantage of speaking late in the programme, I have been able to hear the very interesting discussions and I changed the title of my talk. So what I would like to talk about is the needs for professional development of teachers if they are going to teach about sustainable development. Because I want to reflect on some of the things that we've heard here and that, we, that I have learned and I would like to see what the implications of that are for teachers' professional development. Yesterday, I think we were all very moved by the students from the Ross Institute. And I was particularly interested to hear about their declaration of principles for um, sustainable development. And if I could have my first slide, I would like to um, say what I mean. Uh, so there we are. That is the revised title of my talk. That was the original title. I don't want to confuse you. This is what I'm going to talk about today. So the students from the Ross Institute told us that environmental education is not a privilege, but a right. And this was their first principle, number one. But you know, I don't think even that goes far enough. It is a right from the point of view of the students, but from the point of view of all of us, it's also a responsibility. It is a responsibility that we, who have influence over education systems, provide young people with that right towards environmental education. And we have to, this, this is what we are here to talk about today, that responsibility which we all bear on our shoulders because it is global. The second point I would like to emphasize, which is very relevant to my talk today, is something that we have already recognized. And that is that the best performing education systems in the world show us that you cannot have an education system that is better than the quality of its teachers. The quality of teachers is the determining factor in the quality of an education system. And as far as I'm concerned, that will be true for many, many decades to come. Whatever happens with automation and the digital world, that will remain true. So in this talk, I want to begin by saying why I am optimistic. We heard yesterday from Daniel Hillis. He is optimistic. I am optimistic too, and I want to tell you why. I then want to talk about teachers' professional development needs, especially around sustainable development. And then I will tell you about the National Science Learning Center in the UK. Why am I optimistic? Let me give you a couple of examples. 30 years ago, in England, we were very concerned about education standards in London. They were lower than the rest of the United Kingdom. It was very difficult to get teachers. Standards in many schools were low. In just 30 years, London has become the highest achieving place in England for education, as measured by literacy, numeracy, and other core factors. Why is this? Now, many people have stepped forward and said, this is the reason. This is, it was my project and my idea. This is what has made the difference. But analysis of the facts shows 
that more than anything, there is one reason, and that is immigration. London has a higher rate of inward immigration than almost any part of the United Kingdom. It is a very diverse city. And the people who come to London from outside value education. They are often young, motivated. They want education. They want it for their children. And that, above all, is the reason why London has been so successful in education in recent years. And this illustrates, for me, the most important thing in educational success. If you look across the world where higher education attainment has come, and often has come very rapidly, it is the reason, above all, is cultural. It is about how much people value education. And if people value education, they can make most things work, even if they don't have brilliant educational facilities. I used to be the principal of a school near London. And I knew very well that some communities within my school, it was a very diverse school, it had 26 different languages, many different religions, many different cultures. And I knew very well that some cultures valued education more than others. And I knew which cultures those were. And those were the young people who succeeded most. So the, the question of how much people value education is very important. Now, over the last two days, we've had quite a lot of discussion of PISA the International Assessment Programme. And here's an interesting piece of analysis that was done by Dirk von Damme on the 2006 PISA science results. On that graph, the vertical axis is a measure of interest in science, and the horizontal axis is the score in the PISA science tests. And you can see a negative correlation. And down at the bottom right-hand corner, we have countries like Finland and the Netherlands, countries that attain very highly. And in the top left-hand corner, we have countries like Mexico, Turkey, countries that do not attain highly, but they are the countries where the young people are most interested in science. So we have a thirst for knowledge among, and the thirst is strongest amongst those who do not have it. And that is why I'm optimistic, because these are the people who will make the difference. And these are the people who will take the chances we give them, even if they are incomplete chances and not as good as we can offer in the United Kingdom. Now, I'd like to move on to talk about teachers' professional development needs, especially with reference to sustainable development. And I want to take as an example climate change, which is, of course, an enormously important topic that young people need to understand in school. Now, climate change has been very controversial. But I think we're moving to a point where we have quite a lot of settled science. Almost all scientists agree that climate change is happening and it is caused by human activity, mostly related to carbon dioxide. That is fairly settled, very little dis debate. However, there is far more unsettled, uncertain science because we don't know what the temperature rise will be. We don't know what the effect on the sea level will be or on the extreme climatic events. This is uncertain science. But then we have the question of what we should do about it. This is an ethical question. What, what changes in our activities should we make because of the changes that are happening even though we aren't certain what those changes are going to be. 
And therefore, it, it, there is a very important ethical dimension to all of this. And this was, uh, has been acknowledged over the course of uh, our discussions. Uh, Li Yi Chung raised it very clearly, and Dan Wagner asked who will carry forward the ethical teaching. Should it be one teacher or several? Now, in many secondary schools in my country, there is a separate subject which is teaching about ethics, about personal education and personal responsibility. But it's a separate teacher. Should that be the way? Or should, when a science teacher is teaching about climate change, should she or he include the ethical dimension? I think there is a lot to be argued for the ethical dimension to be part of the science teaching because it is naturally and integrally part of it. But this gives us some challenges. Now, we all acknowledge, and Barack Obama said it beautifully, that science is more than just a subject about facts. It's an approach to the world, a critical way to understand and explore and engage with the world. So science is a way of thinking as well as a body of knowledge. And this is very important for the training of teachers. So what are science teachers' professional development needs? Well, first, they need basic knowledge and skills around science. And we could break this down. Content knowledge, the facts. For example, what is carbon dioxide? What does that formula mean? But then we have what you might call process knowledge, the methods of science. People must understand that science is never certain. Einstein said, no experiment can prove me correct, but one experiment can prove me wrong. And this is the nature of science. Science moves by trying to disprove what has already been established. And this means that science is very uncertain. And people need to accept that. And one difficulty is that often people draw the conclusion, these scientists, they can never agree. They're always dis disagreeing with each other. Well, that's the nature of science. And that is what we have to teach young people in schools. So the nature of scientific knowledge. And then finally, if we agree that the ethics around these scientific issues should be part of science lessons, then that is part of what teachers need for their professional development. So that, that, that's the knowledge and the skills. But then, of course, how do we teach all of these things? What are the pedagogical skills needed to teach about science knowledge, the nature of science, and the ethics? And yesterday, uh, David Wilgenbus said to us, uh, these are often things that teachers feel uncomfortable with. Often teachers, this is outside of their comfort zone to teach in uh, aspects such as ethics. My argument is that science teachers need both content knowledge and pedagogical skills. And all, everything, all the work that I've done in professional development tells me that this is true. Now let me move to the subject of the National Science Learning Center in the UK. So this is a, a major center for professional development um, designed for science teachers across the UK. Um, it was uh, funded by the Wellcome Trust, which is a major charitable foundation in the United Kingdom, together with the UK government and UK industry. So companies like BP, Rolls-Royce, GSK have helped to fund it. So it's a very interesting three-way collaboration. It's in the University of York, where I work, uh, and uh, that, that puts it right in the center of the United Kingdom, between Scotland and the south of England. And it's for all teachers, primary, secondary, vocational teachers. And critically, the professional development is free. Teachers pay nothing. And it is a very, it's a beautiful building, and it's very comfortable, and it is quite luxurious. 
And this was what I wanted. When we had the grant to set up the National Science Learning Centre, I wanted science teachers to walk into it and think, wow, this is for me. What I do is important, and this place has been built for me. But of course, one centre cannot do everything, and so this is part of a network of science learning around the country. We've been running nearly 10 years, and Prime Minister Tony Blair in March 2006 uh, launched the uh, centre. Now, when we began, back in 2006, the, the model was the National Science Learning Centre in the middle of the country and 10 centres around in the regions. Since then, the model has developed a little. And so today, if you look at the right-hand side of that picture, you will see that it's made up of in the, the yellow is the National Science Learning Centre in the, for the whole country, but the grey dots are science learning partnerships. So the model that we have moved to is to have a centre together with learning partnerships spread around the country, and those learning partnerships are based in schools. And this is important, I want to come back to it. What have we learnt about professional development? We know that it must be relevant to the teachers who come. It must matter to them, for their schools and their children. Of course, that differs from school to school and from teacher to teacher. It must be followed up in school. So it's no use learning something and not using it. You must use it afterwards. And it must be sustained. It's no use giving one professional development experience and leaving it. It must be sustained. In this bar chart, the green bar is the increase in scores, test scores, in primary schools for teachers who come, who have professional development when it is spread across two years. The, right, the red bar is the same amount of professional development but it's concentrated in, in, at one time. So this is the idea of sustained professional development. We have a number of uh, strong pieces of evidence about the impact of the science learning centres. That's just one. Um, these are on, on the vertical axis are the scores in our main examination for 16-year-olds. And on the, on, the vertical, uh, on the horizontal axis is frequency of attending science learning centres. And the more they come, the higher the scores. So we have very convincing evidence of the impact of this model of professional development. And just to illustrate the kind of programs that we run, these are four programs that relate to sustainable development that are run around our science learning network. In the partnership schools, um, these, and these are courses that all teachers can attend. And I've just given you um, <coughs> those examples uh, 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 of aspects of sustainable development. But in our country, it's very important that programs like this are linked to the curriculum. So if you take, for example, climate change, in our de development programs, we show how climate change is linked to the secondary chemistry curriculum because the teachers have, are under great pressure to deliver the national curriculum. So we try to link it always to it. Now finally, I'd like to reflect on whether the model that I have set out for you, which we are very fortunate to have in the United Kingdom, would it work in other countries? The, exa the answer is no. The exact model would not work. Of course it wouldn't. There, are, there is such diversity of countries in the developed and the developing world. But there are some things that we can learn. And the first one is my three points about successful professional development. And those three factors are crucial for professional development anywhere and everywhere. So we, we can learn from that. Secondly, 
we should learn from the evolution of our network, which is to evolve away from centers that are dominated by physical centers towards partnerships that are based in schools, in the grassroots. And yesterday, Margaret Archer was reminding us that centralized solutions don't work. Well, I think you do need some centralized aspects because you need a central organization. But the more we can devolve professional development down towards the grassroots and into schools, the better. And I think that's a rule that applies to all countries. So, finally, I'd just like to reflect with you the great quotation from Goethe, science and art belong to the whole world, and before them vanish the barriers of humanity. I've spent most of my career in science education, and I've been very privileged to be in gatherings like this one with colleagues from around the world. And what I realize is that science education is a universal language. It is universal, and the, and the problems that we face individually are the problems that we face together. And that's why I think that this gathering here over these few days is so important. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>